Then let us continue with the discussion of this field theory defined by the Lagrangian written here on the blackboard. And as we announced the last time, we will show that the quantum theory corresponding to this Lagrangian is actually the same theory as the particle theory that we have discussed in the previous section, a multi-particle theory of uh, identical bosonic particles, each of which is described by the one-particle Hamiltonian from the beginning of the chapter. So you will discover that such a field theory is actually equivalent to such a multi-particle theory. What we will need to do is first on the classical level go from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian picture, define Poisson brackets and then we can turn to the quantum theory, obtain operators with certain commutation relations. The quantum theory needs to be interpreted and the result of the interpretation is what I just announced. Okay, so let us begin first of all on the classical level with the Lagrangian formalism, which uh, means that we will write down the Euler-Lagrange equations which are the equations of motion corresponding to this classical theory. And uh, in general, the Euler-Lagrange equations for a field theory are given by zero is equal to d mu of dl derivative with respect to d mu of a field minus derivative dl with respect to uh, the field itself. And here we have two independent fields, namely Psi and Psi star, which need to be treated uh, independently of each other because the Lagrangian is complex and uh, alternatively you could treat real part and imaginary part as independent. But let's treat Psi and Psi star as independent and then actually it's even easier if we take the Lagrange equation corresponding to Psi star but the equations would be the same anyway. But let's take the one for Psi star. What is then the equation? You need to take the derivative of L with respect to derivatives of Psi star. Where are here derivatives of uh, Psi star? Uh, here there is a derivative of Psi star, uh, namely a spatial derivative. And uh, so, in fact, you can rewrite this in the action. You could say this is the same as minus psi star Laplace psi because in the action you can do partial integration and forget total derivatives and therefore you can write this in such a way that there appears actually no derivative of psi star at all. And then the Lagrangian is entirely free of derivatives of psi star so that derivative here gives zero. Whereas the derivative of L with respect to psi star, you can simply read off. Here it's the coefficient of psi star and here it's the coefficient of psi star as well. And therefore we get here i times psi dot plus 1 over 2m la plus psi. And uh, let us from now on ignore the term with the potential. As we discussed, we will ignore it, but one could also treat it in the same amount. Um, the to, to the, the square means it's real, but the minus, also down I see a complex uh, term and, and up the real term. Or am I confusing something? If I take this square, it should be real. And this square is real. Yes. Psi star multiplied by the second derivative of the psi is real too? It's real up to a total derivative. So that is real and uh, that is the same thing up to the total derivative. Um, sorry. Nabla of the product psi star nabla psi. Right, so that is a total derivative and if you evaluate this you get two terms. One of the terms is cancelled by this one and the other term reproduces this. Okay, so this is an identity and if you think of the action, uh, the d4x integral of the Lagrangian, then you can neglect the total derivative term and uh, in that sense for the action this and that 
are equivalent ways to write the Lagrangian and in this uh, second way we can read off the equation of motion in an even simpler way and that is just a quick abbreviation. Anyway, the Lagrange equation of motion is now this one and that is an equation that you should know. It's the usual Schrödinger equation, just written in a slightly different form. And this equation here has a different interpretation as the ordinary Schrödinger equation because here our Psi is not the wave function of a one particle state in a single particle quantum mechanical theory, but this is a field. A field means a physical quantity which is defined at every x. So at every x there is a degree of freedom which has some dynamics, whereas in quantum mechanical wave functions uh, the whole wave function as an entire function of x describes one degree of freedom, namely the particle. Okay, so it's a different interpretation but the same equation. Anyway, uh, let us go on. Uh, Lagrange equation is one step. The next step is the canonical conjugate momenta. And so there is one canonical momentum that I call pi, which is the one corresponding to psi. That is defined by the derivative of dl, derivative with respect to psi dot. And there would be pi star, which is defined as the derivative of l with respect to psi star dot. What are the results of those definitions? Pi is this derivative here, so pi is i times psi star. And what is pi star? Pi star is actually zero because psi star dot doesn't appear. And so here you see what I announced before, namely pi and pi star behave independently of each other because the Lagrangian is complex. And second, you see that we get here what we call constraints. Namely, we have relationships between canonical variables and conjugate momenta. First of all, this momentum here is entirely zero. And that is a simple type of a constraint, which we also encountered in our Lagrangian with this QB variable. And here that is also a constraint because pi is directly related to a canonical variable. No time derivative. So both of these definitions amount to two constraints. And then you know that it's not necessarily trivial to go from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian. And that is why, as I already said, there are some subtleties in this procedure. And here we will do a simple trick which leads to the correct result. And I gave you a reference where you can find um, much more details on this. So, okay, but these are the two canonical momenta. And uh, now this uh, simple procedure to obtain the correct Hamiltonian. First of all, the Hamiltonian here in this field theory is also expressed as a space integral over some Hamiltonian density, which I write as curly h, and then the curly h is defined by the same kind of Legendre transformation as uh, usually the full Hamiltonian. So the simple way is that we use that constraint here, psi pi star is identically zero, so that means we ignore the variable with the star, because anyway it would give zero in the Legendre, uh, Legendre transformation. And uh, so we carry out the Legendre transformation only for the variable without star, for pi and psi. And once we do it, uh, we insert the results of those constraint equations use only psi and pi and eliminate psi star and pi star using the constraints. Okay, so if we do it, then we obtain this curly H is given by the Legendre expression, but only for the unstarred variables, so pi times psi dot minus the Lagrangian. 
what happens if we evaluate this? Pi is i times psi star. So we have here i times psi star times psi dot minus l. What happens if we do this minus l? You see that this term here exactly cancels. And what remains is minus the remainder of the Lagrangian, which is just this term, because that will be neglected anyway. So therefore we get curly h is equal to plus 1 over 2m times the square of nabla times psi. And now we should rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of unstarred variables only. So here there appears a psi star. Psi star is replaced by minus i times pi. And then we write this as minus i over 2m and nabla pi times nabla psi. That is our Hamiltonian. And you can check that the Hamiltonian equations of motion are completely identical to the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion from before. And that shows that this simple procedure gives the right Hamiltonian. The next step on the classical level after having the momenta and the Hamiltonian is Poisson brackets, which offer yet another a way to express the equations of motion. And so here we simply write down the Poisson brackets of interest to us are the ones for psi and pi without star. So we have one Poisson bracket psi uh, with another psi is uh, always zero and the Poisson bracket of psi with pi at some value like a Kronecker delta, but with continuous variables, we get a delta function in three dimensions of the difference x minus y. And then you could write the Hamiltonian equations of motions alternatively also with Poisson brackets. Now this completes the discussion of the classical theory and from this starting point we can obtain a quantum theory by what is called correspondence principle or canonical quantization. This principle is the thing that you have evaluated or used in ordinary quantum mechanics to obtain the simplest quantum mechanical systems like harmonic oscillator, hydrogen atom and so on. And it simply tells you that all the classical canonical variables become operators and the Poisson brackets are replaced by commutators and uh, the values of the commutators are derived from the values of the Poisson brackets times i h bar always. So that is, let me uh, write here the procedure for quantization. So the procedure is simply that pi, uh, psi and pi and h become operators. And just to be clear again, I use a hat symbol for the operators today. Psi hat, pi hat, and h, which is a function of pi and psi. And uh, so we use the same function as classically and insert the operators psi hat and pi hat into that function. Then we obtain the Hamiltonian operator. And the Poisson brackets. So maybe I will give here an index. PB stands for Poisson brackets. They become minus i times operators, operator commutation relation. And then we use the constraint um, between pi and psi star. Pi is equal to i times psi star uh, becomes an operator identity. So we simply identify uh, the canonical momentum operator with psi star um, in uh, more precisely on the level of operators than uh, the adjoint psi dagger. Okay, if we simply apply this recipe, 
then we obtain the following set of operators and relationships. Namely, we have the operator psi hat of x, we have the operator pi hat of x, and we have the operator uh, the full h hat, which is the integral of our Hamiltonian density. And we know the commutation relation psi hat of x commutator with psi hat of y is zero because the corresponding Poisson bracket was zero as well. Then we have psi hat of x with psi hat dagger of y. That is not zero. And what is psi dagger? Psi dagger is minus i times pi. So we need to know the commutation relation between psi and pi, which is i times a delta function. The i cancels, and uh, so we get here simply a delta function without i, three-dimensional delta function of x minus y. So this is the commutator between psi and psi decker. And finally, let me also write down our full Hamiltonian according to this quantization recipe. H is the integral d3x over the Hamiltonian density. And the Hamiltonian density is what is given over there, minus i over 2m times the thing with nabla pi and nabla psi. And there we can, if we want, leave either the pi or replace pi by this operator identity with psi decker, whatever we prefer. And it looks a little bit nicer if we write it in terms of psi decker, then we have no i here in the relationship, 1 over 2m times nabla psi decker times nabla psi. This is our quantum theory. This is our quantum theory. And what do we discover? We discover that this quantum theory has, at least according to what is written in the books, it has so far identical properties to the quantum theory from the previous section, because our multiparticle theory, uh, which we first defined with Fox space, then A decker of P, A of P. Then we went to a field theory description with uh, Psi of X. Those operators appearing there had identical properties. So we also had exactly the same commutation relations and we had the identical form for the Hamiltonian. So we can say here that this is the same as in our previous section, which was section 122 exactly the same operator relations. So, but the quantum theory is not completely specified by only writing down the operators. In addition to the operators, you also need a Hilbert space of states on which the operators are defined. So, the structure of the Hilbert space in principle follows from here, but at least we have to identify this structure and analyze what states are possible. So let us quickly do that, because our postulate does not say anything about the space of states. We need to derive it. So the Hilbert space of states. How can we analyze what kind of states there should be such that those relationships are fulfilled? And one easy way to see it is to go back to momentum space. So we now rewrite by definition our quantum field operator psi in terms of a decker of p. So psi of x is now written as the same relationship as last time, d3p divided by 2 pi to the 3 over 2 times e to the plus i p x times a sub p. 
So by definition, it is rewritten like this, and that defines a new operator A of P, which at this point is an unknown quantity, but we can now, of course, determine what relationships this A of P fulfills, and uh, how can we do it? Of course, we plug in this uh, rewritten version of Psi, go into the commutation relations, and then we discover what commutation relations this A of P satisfies. And those are, of course, also the same as uh, last time. So A of P and A dagger of P satisfies the same commutation relations as last time. As in section that was 1 to 1. And we can also plug in to the Hamiltonian uh, the rewritten version in terms of A of P, and then we obtain our Hamiltonian expressed in terms of this A of P and A dagger of P. And then, of course, the result is also that our Hamiltonian H takes also the same form as in our section 1 to 1. And what was that form? It was the form of a harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian, just integrated over all possible values of P. The commutation relations and the Hamiltonian are exactly the ones of a set of infinitely many different harmonic oscillators. Namely, for every P, we have one harmonic oscillator with the appropriate commutation relations and the appropriate term in H. And uh, that means we only have to go back to uh, the harmonic oscillator discussion to analyze what kind of states there should be in our Hilbert space. Namely, the states are exactly the same kind of states as we have in the harmonic oscillator. That means for every P, there is a ground state, a first excited state, second excited state, and so on. And all the states can be constructed by taking the ground state and applying a deckers to it. So therefore, we can immediately write this down. H is a collection of harmonic oscillators, namely one oscillator for every value of the three-dimensional momentum P. And what are the frequencies of those harmonic oscillators? The frequencies let's call them omega p, are p square over 2m, the kinetic energies. And uh, therefore, for every value of p, we know what our space of states is. We have a basis of states given by a ground state then a first excited state and higher excited states. And since this uh, set of states exists for each P, the whole set of states that exist overall are obtained from one ground state by applying all, possibles, uh, all possible A deckers for all possible values of P onto the ground state. So we immediately know the total basis of states is the following, namely we have the ground state which we can now call the vacuum and then we have excited states which are of the form A dagger P1 uh, and then as many A daggers as you like up to some A dagger of Pn applied to the ground state. That gives a basis of our states. And so now you see that also the basis of states is the same one as the one we had in our previous section. It's the same basis as the basis of our Fox space with uh, arbitrary numbers of identical particles of this particular type. So we have a quantum theory 
which has the identical operators as last time and the identical space of states as the last time. Therefore, it's the identical quantum theory. So that is our final result. We have proven that the classical field theory described at the top by the Lagrangian, if we quantize it, leads to the same quantum theory as our multiparticle uh, theory was from the beginning. That is what I wanted to show you. And let me now write down a small list of some interpretation points which you can take away from this discussion. So how can we interpret this result? Why is it of interest to you? So first of all, let's recap and let's really write down what I have now said a few times. What we have done is we started from a field theory and a classical field theory defined by a classical Lagrangian. We quantized it and the result is the same quantum theory as in section 121 or section 122. How can we interpret this and why is it interesting? First of all, our field theory is a classical field theory and what is the physics of field theories in general? A field theory is a theory where you have degrees of freedom sitting everywhere in space or even space-time. These degrees of freedom interact locally with each other. So if you have some disturbance somewhere in your field, what happens is the disturbance will propagate slowly with a certain speed into other regions of space. That means you get waves. The typical uh, small excitations of a field theory are always waves. And here in this particular case, we get a certain wave equation, which happens to be the Schrödinger equation. But anyway, in any field theory, you will always get waves. Here, particularly simple plane waves with a certain relationship between wave number and energy or frequency. But anyway, you always get waves. What happens in a quantum theory of waves? Waves are oscillations. So quantum theory of oscillations you can obtain from the harmonic oscillator discussion. Oscillators behave in a quantum theory in a quantized way. You can have either zero oscillations or you can have one quantum of oscillation, two quanta of oscillations, three quanta of oscillations and so on. And for the case of wave it's the same thing. You can have either no excitation of a wave or you have one single quantum of a wave, two wave quanta, three wave quanta, and so on. What is a single wave quantum? A single quantum of a wave is something which has a certain momentum and a certain energy. These are exactly the properties of particles. So in a quantum theory of waves, the single excitation modes of waves are behaving exactly uh, like particles. And so a quantum theory of waves is always a theory of particles. But of what kind of particles, of how many particles, you can have as many particles as you like because you can excite the wave multiple times. You can excite it with no end, you can excite it as often as you like. Each excitation corresponds your interpretation to a particle so you can have uh, many particles in your theory automatically. You can create particles, destroy particles by exciting the wave more and more. And uh, are those particles identical? Uh, and if so, why are they identical? Yes, they are identical. And how can you now understand this question from the beginning of this section? Why is the electron on the Earth and the electron on the Moon identical? Here in this picture, we simply have a field theory and the field theory is translationally invariant. So the way the fields interact with each other are the same on the Earth and the Moon because of translational invariance. And that explains why if you excite a wave here or there, you get the identical kind of particle as a result. And so in this field theory viewpoint, all of those issues are very nicely explained. So let me just write down all of this in a shorthand uh, way. So the equation of motion gives us waves. 
and the quantization of the waves is uh, described by these operators A decker of P, which provide wave quanta. These are creation operators for wave quanta. But the wave quanta have properties which are identical to the properties of what we normally would identify as particles. So we just say they are particles. Therefore, as a Hilbert space of states, we automatically get a Fox space corresponding to all those possible excitations of wave quanta. Therefore, we get multi-particle states. And the particles are identical. All of this is an automatic consequence. And so our initial question with this identity of particles is uh, answered to, to some uh, extent. Why particles are identical? So you could give the answer, we have a field theory which is translationally invariant. So this could give you an answer why there are identical particles. Uh, and the next question could only be why should nature be described by a field theory? This is not yet answered. Once you would have an answer to that, you could really say nature must involve such a concept as identical particles. Okay, but uh, some simpler consequences also, if you have this field theory, it is identical to our multiparticle theory, and the multiparticle theory in turn was of course an extension of our single particle theory from the beginning. So that means of course this field theory contains as a special case and as a sub-theory sub the normal beloved single particle quantum theory from quantum mechanics one, described by the Hamiltonian from uh, the last lecture. This is completely contained in this. Uh, we can also recover the single particle theory by restricting to a one particle subspace. So we have now two points of view. We have the point of view from the beginning, where we started with a single particle theory, then we went in a pedestrian way to multiparticles and then discovered a field theory as an output. And now we have started with a field theory, quantized it and obtained the multiparticle theory as a consequence. And we have this nice interpretation that identical particles are an automatic result of that. So you might wonder, uh, is this now the superior point of view? And I would actually say, no, both points of view are valuable and are important to understand and important to know. So the first point of view, which we did the last time, where we started from a single particle theory, you really go step by step from observations. You observe particles, then you observe identical multi-particle systems, and you want to have the most efficient possible description in terms of quantum operators. And you discover that field theory operators are an efficient description of your observed multi-particle states. Here, we start from a field theory postulate, but the field theory is not really 
directly motivated by observations. You uh, start with this as a theoretical construct, and then you discover that it gives you all of the observed features of multiparticle systems, which you can, in that sense, explain or trace back to such a fundamental postulate. But the original postulate is not directly um, enforced upon you by experimental observations. And so I would say uh, both points of view are important, and so we can go back and forth between both points of views. Now let me just mention uh, that ends the main discussion, but let me mention in addition, I ignored here in the calculation our V term, the term with the potential. We could also have included that. And uh, could have proceeded in a similar way. And then a final comment. In general, field theories have a lot of similar properties, but of course not identical properties. So this was a very simple and non-relativistic field theory, and we have this very simple but important relationship between the field operator psi of x and these creation operators a of p. And uh, I interpreted that wave excitations always behave like particles and uh, the theory is translationally invariant and so on. So for example, the translational invariance is a property that we will always have in relativistic theories as well. But in relativistic theories, such a relationship actually is much more complicated. And in the case of fields with interactions, it's even more complicated. And there is not always such a one-to-one -one correspondence between simple creation operators for particle states with definite momenta and our field operators. So this relation will change in very interesting ways, which correspond to relativistic invariance. But nevertheless, uh, the basic interpretation that field theories give rise to particle interpretations and automatically lead to theories with identical multi-particle states, that will remain always the case. Okay. That ends our discussion. Thanks, and then we can come to the exercise.